big announcement. Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee, who has been here in studio with us before, has announced his re-election campaign. Lieutenant Governor, thanks yeah. for coming in today. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Well, I know you're on the road uh, hitting the circuit, but tell folks a little bit who weren't able to be there this morning. Tell us a little bit about the announcement and, and the reaction to it and, and what folks have told you. Yeah, so uh, I made my announcement, uh, but I was at uh, a business in Warwick uh, because we're really focusing on the small businesses in the state of Rhode Island. And I was able to make my announcement there that I'm going to be asking the people of the state of Rhode Island to uh, reelect me in uh, 2018 as the lieutenant governor. And so there was real, we had a good turnout uh, with, with supporters uh, that represent not only the small business communities, but also a number of the other communities that our office has been involved in, which is long-term health care issues, and certainly education came up, uh, you know, as an important factor in terms of the things I believe in. And uh, so it was, a good, it was a good announcement. And you highlighted a number of your achievements during your first term in office, and you just sort of mentioned a few. But what did you, you know, what do you really want folks to know as they look to the polls in 2018? Well, what I want to let, know is that Lieutenant Governor's office can make a difference. We have made a, a, a substantial difference in terms of our intervening in terms of uh, the Public Utility Commission, certainly on behalf of the ratepayers as over the shareholders so people can save money on their, on their electric bills and power Rhode Island was set up. We also have uh, chaired the Small Business uh, Advisory Council, and so we've used that to leverage uh, tours uh, and going to every community in the state of Rhode Island. Our theme has been number 39. So we visited all the business, businesses and other, you know, senior centers and things that are really important. Talking to people, uh, I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, you need to listen first before you can be heard. And now we know loud and clear that we want a good business environment. We want to have great public schools and we want to have municipalities that are fiscally sound which I've had experience at as a former mayor. As, for a, former, years. as yes. a former mayor. Yes. And one of the last things we had you in on was the issue of Empower RI and talking about ways that folks can really, you know, make more choices in terms of their uh, utilities and electricity providers. Uh, talk with us about the current issues facing National Grid. We did see, obviously, a big storm this past week. You came out talking about it. Um, you know, what can be done moving forward? So I think that... Uh, first of all, we I visited the businesses, right? Uh, because that's been our, that's in our wheelhouse, and then uh, saw businesses throughout the state, up in Johnston uh, in, in Cumberland, and they lost hundred tens of thousands of dollars of business, mm. and so and yet uh, we want to forget that it ever happened, and we can't forget that it happened. So as a mayor, when we had problems uh, back in two thousand and ten. Uh, uh, Town Administrator Alma and I stepped up and said they need to do better in terms of the preventative uh, strategies. So a lot more trees were cut, a lot more limbs were taken off the wires. But quite frankly, if you're going to have, um, if you know that something's coming, you always could have a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Uh, we, you know, we didn't fare as well as Massachusetts mm. did in the recovery. And we know that the percentages decrease at a sharper rate of people who are out of electricity in Massachusetts than they were in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you, you know, as leaders, we need to make a, uh, take a stand on it. And I'm glad that the governor has is, is asked for a, you know, a formal um, report in terms of what that, you know, how that response was. And I would also say that we've said today is we've put in legislation uh, that got passed both in the House and the Senate and abruptly when, that, when the General Assembly ended in June didn't get passed, but it would really put the heat on National Grid to respond to its customers in a way where last week they didn't. And talk with us a little bit about that, because I want to have this sort of legislative conversation, because one of your primary opponents mm -hmm. who's declared, Aaron Ruggenberg, has talked about a public power approach here in Rhode Island. Let's start with that. Uh, I'm sure you've seen what he put forward. Is that something you agree with? Well, it's not new. Uh, it's not new. Uh, in 2014, when we intervened at the Public Utility Commission, a month before I became Lieutenant Governor, we put on the record uh, to the Public Utility Commission that they should be looking at Pasco Electric as a model. Why are they providing, uh, you know, at that time, electric rates at less cost mm. than the national grid? So we put that on the table then. Okay. Um, it's... You know, I think we need to be honest with people. It's very difficult. Massachusetts has uh, 41 of those uh, municipal uh, electric uh, companies going, but they haven't approved one since 1930. So it's been a long time, mm -hmm. and there's reasons for that. Uh, there's a, it's a very heavy cost to pur purchase the infrastructure. I think that it's a lot. I, I, I don't, 
mind going down that road and see where it leads, uh, but I, I, I'd rather not go down dead ends, and I'd rather be looking at, let's, let's get the competition brewing. Let's get uh, efficiency strategies implemented. Let's uh, spend all the dollars that we pay on our bills for efficiency programs. Let's look at uh, alternate uh, 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 renewable energy sources. Uh, wind power is, is, a, is a certainly a good option and other, other things like that. So I, I, I kind of, our legislation said, look, they need to respond uh, in a more, uh, in a way that we can measure. And if they don't respond well to the businesses or, or the ratepayers, there should be penalties involved there. Uh, we also want to increase the competition with a, with a bill again that got passed both by the House and Senate and got stalled when they abruptly ended, which was very frustrating. But yes, I think there's many things you can do, and I think that you, you don't leave any stone unturned. Do you think there'll be more pressure this coming session for this legislation if it's reintroduced, given the events that have taken place Ab Absolutely. Recently? We were proactive when we, when, we, when we intervened to get rid of the billing adjustment, which saved ratepayers, oh, I think, close to a million, million and a half dollars a year. Uh, so we're proactive about that. We're proactive of getting the website up. Uh, you know, in advance, we didn't know we were going to have a 53% rate increase uh, this last fall, but we did, and now you can actually go to Empower Rhode Island and you can virtually eliminate the entire increase and thousands of people are doing that. So I like the idea of being proactive. We were ahead of the curve on the response. It would have been nice if that law was passed and we would have been able to hold the national grid accountable in a way that currently we were, you know, we're open to. It, there would have been no question if that was passed in terms of the fact that they would have had an answer about their response time. Today, it's up, you know, we have to push for that. Um, yes, I think it's going to be a whole different uh, animal, and I think that certainly uh, elections bring that stuff out, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> they certainly yes. do. And the governor calling for this review, do we have a sense of time frame of when we're going to be getting answers from the DPUC? Yes, yeah, so I only can reflect back to I think the last time there was one was in 2010. I, I'm not sure that was Sandy or what it was, but... Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's not a quick. It'll yeah. be several months, and it's, oh, I, I think they should look at it very strongly. But I, I think that the national grid, I would have preferred them come out and say, you know, we got caught, we caught, you know, caught shorthanded. And that's the reason why. Rather than come out, that's what kind of disturbed me a little bit initially was that, oh, no, this is something that, you know, we were ready for, but it got big, you know, there, there was a whole bunch of excuses. And I, I'd rather just say, look, we were shorthanded. <laughs> that's what happened. And I think that's what the report's going to show, that they weren't prepared. They didn't have a plan B. We've known for a long time that there was hurricanes down in Florida and Texas, right, oh, yeah. in Puerto Rico. And so, uh, you know, there certainly were strategy meetings about, well, gee, should we pay, should we, uh, you know, should, how should we handle this? And they really structured it wrong. Well, we'll be interested to see what the results of this report are moving forward. And you touched upon uh, some of your achievements in office to date, but if reelected, you know, what's the unfinished business? What's on the agenda for Lieutenant Governor McKee if reelected? Yeah, so I think one of them is I was chair of the National Lieutenant Governors Association in 2016. I got to uh, spend a day here and a day there in state houses and with lieutenant governors all over the country and saw how they operate. And I, we're going to we're going to see whether we can gain some momentum with the legislature to. Uh, put a constitutional amendment on that would actually have the governor and the uh, lieutenant governor run as a team right from the very beginning in primaries right through the general election as they do in Iowa. Uh, and seven, uh, I, th I don't think people realize this, how important that lieutenant governor spot is. Seven lieutenant governors since I, in the last year since I was chairman have not, are now governors in the, in the country. Yeah. Seven lieutenant governors are governors. And so that's why I made my uh, points that about my record as an executive, my record as a business person, my record in nonprofits, uh, and working on behalf of children and, and seniors and business community, that uh, you really do need to have someone in that office that has that executive experience and, and, the, and the practical knowledge about how to run budgets and how to um, manage um, organizations. Uh, because that can happen. I, I used the Bill Belichick line, I don't think I'll get it perfect, but he basically said, look, at, if you don't have a really uh, talented and skilled a backup as a quarterback, then you put the risk, you risk the entire team's uh, future is at risk. And so I think the same is true. A lieutenant governor, and I, I, I know that it's a role. Uh, I'm willing to. I, I'm happy to play that role. 
Uh, but one of the major things that uh, needs to be, make sure that we understand that uh, a lieutenant governor could become governor. So is that one of the major issues you're going to, to to run on is this issue of experience? We have a, a young uh, Aaron Ruggenberg, a state rep. Is, is that really one of the differentiating factors that you Well, I'm going to run on my record, um, which, I mean, in Cumberland on the finances, junk bond rating when I showed up, eight upgrades since I, when I left, I worked with a real good team. We had double A rating. So I know the finances, we you know, pretty well. And, um, and and business, so you know, it's been we've rode this roller coaster in the state of Rhode Island for for 30 years or more, and uh, it's it's a it's a difficult uh, journey. So I understand that, and that's why. So yeah, the ex my r track record and the success that I've had is both an executive um, and and in the business, and also uh, working in education. And I brought up the Mayoral Academy as being a terrific model that we should really be building off of and and stop stop trying to uh, shut these mayoral academies down and very proud of our school district during that time. Uh, it, they, our school district improved every year since the mayoral academy opened up. So education is a big deal. Actually we had uh, one, of our, one of our schools and uh, district schools was uh, just received the Blue Ribbon Award uh, which is the top award in the country. So our, our school systems have done fine and competition does help. Well, why did you in today? I'm sure we'll have you in moving forward, but when you make yes. the official political announcement that you're officially announcing the yes. run for lieutenant governor when once I, again. When I sign the papers in June or, or before that, was, yeah, I'd be happy when to the, come When back. the rubber hits the road, when yes. we get into the heat of the, the campaign cycle and there's issues that come up between candidates, I'm sure we'll have you back in the studio to yes. talk about those as well. Maybe some debates. Yes. So I appreciate you taking the time to yes. come in. I know you're on the circuit today, but yes. wanted folks to hear right well, from thank you. thank you for having Lieutenant me. Lieutenant Governor Dan yes. McKee, we'll let you go around the corner, and we'll be back at 3 o'clock with Lifestyle with Ava Thank Godette. you. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep.